episode 136. Fred and George were heroes that night in the Gryffindor common room. Even Hermione fought her way through the excited crowd around them to congratulate them. They were wonderful fireworks, she said admiringly. Thanks, said George, looking both surprised and pleased. Weasley's wildfire whiz-bangs. Only thing is, we used our whole stock, so we're going to have to start again from scratch now. It was worth it, though, said Fred, who was taking orders from clamoring Gryffindors. If you want to add your name to the waiting list, Hermione, it's five galleons for your basic blaze box and twenty for the deflagration deluxe. Hermione returned to the table where Harry and Ron were sitting, staring at their school bags as though hoping their homework might spring out of it and start doing itself. Oh, why don't we have a night off, said Hermione brightly as a silver-tailed Weasley rocket zoomed past the window. After all, the Easter holidays start on Friday and we'll have plenty of time then. Are you feeling all right? Ron asked, staring at her in disbelief. Now you mention it, said Hermione happily. Do you know, I think I'm feeling a bit rebellious. Harry could still hear the distant bangs of escaped firecrackers when he and Ron went up to bed an hour later. And as he got undressed, a sparkler floated past the tower, still resolutely spelling out the word poo. He got into bed, yawning. With his glasses off, the occasional fireworks still passing the window became blurred, looking like sparkling clouds, beautiful and mysterious against the black sky. He turned on to his side, wondering how Umbridge was feeling about her first day in Dumbledore's job, and how Fudge would react when he heard that the school had spent most of the day in a state of advanced disruption. Smiling to himself, he closed his eyes. The whizzes and bangs of escaped fireworks in the grounds seemed to be growing more distant. Or perhaps he, Harry, was simply speeding away from them. He had fallen right into the corridor leading to the Department of Mysteries. He was speeding toward the plain black door. Let it open. Let it open. It did. He was inside the circular room lined with doors. He crossed it, placed his hand upon an identical door, and it swung inward. Now he was in a long, rectangular room full of an odd mechanical clicking. There were dancing flecks of light on the walls, but he did not pause to investigate. He had to go on. There was a door at the far end. It, too, opened at his touch. And now he was in a dimly lit room as high and wide as a church, full of nothing but rows and rows of towering shelves, each laden with small, dusty, spun-glass spheres. Now Harry's heart was beating fast with excitement. He knew where to go. He ran forward, but... His footsteps made no noise in the enormous, deserted room. There was something in this room that he wanted very, very much. Something he wanted, or somebody else wanted. His scar was hurting. Bang! Harry awoke instantly, confused and angry. The dark dormitory was full of the sound of laughter. Cool, said Seamus, who was silhouetted against the window. I think one of those Catherine wheels hit a rocket and it's like they made it. Come and see. Harry heard Ron and Dean scramble out of bed for a better look. He lay quite still and silent while the pain in his scar subsided and disappointment washed over him. He felt as though a wonderful treat had been snatched from him at the very last moment. He had got so close that time. Glittering pink and silver winged piglets were now soaring past the windows of Gryffindor Tower. Harry lay and listened to the appreciative whoops of the Gryffindors in the dormitories below them. 
His stomach gave a sickening jolt as he remembered that he had occlumency the following evening. Harry spent the whole of the next day dreading what Snape was going to say if he found out how much farther into the Department of Mysteries he had penetrated during his last dream. With a surge of guilt, he realized that he had not practiced occlumency once since their last lesson. There had been too much going on since Dumbledore had left. He was sure he would not have been able to empty his mind even if he had tried. He doubted, however, whether Snape would accept that excuse. He attempted a little last-minute practice during classes that day, but it was no good. Hermione kept asking him what was wrong whenever he fell silent to rid himself of all thought and emotion. And, after all, the best moment to empty his brain was not while teachers were firing review questions at the class. Resigned to the worst, he set off for Snape's office after dinner. Halfway across the entrance hall, however, Cho came hurrying up to him. Over here, said Harry, glad of a reason to postpone his meeting with Snape and beckoning her across to the corner of the entrance hall where the giant hourglasses stood. Gryffindor's was now almost empty. Are you okay? Umbridge hasn't been asking you about the DA, has she? Oh, no, said Cho hurriedly. No, it was only, well, I just wanted to say, Harry, I never dreamed Marietta would tell. Yeah, well, said Harry moodily. He did feel Cho might have chosen her friends a bit more carefully. It was small consolation that the last he had heard, Marietta was still up in the hospital wing, and Madame Pomfrey had not been able to make the slightest improvement to her pimples. She's a lovely person, really, said Cho. She just made a mistake. Harry looked at her incredulously. A lovely person who made a mistake? She sold us all out, including you. Well, we all got away, didn't we? said Cho, pleadingly. You know, her mum works for the ministry. It's really difficult for her. Ron's dad works for the ministry, too, Harry said furiously. And in case you hadn't noticed, he hasn't got sneak written across his face. That was a really horrible trick of Hermione Granger's, said Cho fiercely. She should have told us she jinxed that list. I think it was a brilliant idea, said Harry, coldly. Cho flushed, and her eyes grew brighter. Oh, yes, of course. I forgot. If it was darling Hermione's idea... Don't start crying again, said Harry, warningly. I wasn't going to, she shouted. Yeah, well, good, he said. I've got enough to cope with at the moment. Go and cope with it then, she said furiously, turning on her heel and stalking off. Fuming, Harry descended the stairs to Snape's dungeon... And though he knew from experience how much easier it would be for Snape to penetrate his mind if he arrived angry and resentful, he succeeded in nothing but thinking of a few more good things he should have said to Cho about Marietta before reaching the dungeon door. You're late, Potter, said Snape coldly as Harry closed the door behind him. Snape was standing with his back to Harry, removing, as usual, certain of his thoughts and placing them carefully in Dumbledore's pen sieve. He dropped the last silvery strand into the stone basin and turned to face Harry. So, he said, have you been practicing? Yes, Harry lied, looking carefully at one of the legs of Snape's desk. Well, we'll soon find out, won't we? said Snape smoothly. Wand out, Potter. Harry moved into his usual position, facing Snape with the desk between them. His heart was pumping fast with anger at Cho and anxiety about how much Snape was about to extract from his mind. On the count of three, then, said Snape lazily. One, two, 